Hey guys, good afternoon. We finally made it. I'll tell you what, after a 27 minute delay, this better be the best webinar that Canada ID has ever done in its life before. Thank you so much for your patience for those that have joined us today. For those that don't know me, my name is Billy McDermott. I'm the Customer Success Director here at Canada ID in Glasgow. I'm delighted to be joined by Rob Prince today from Talent Nexus. Rob, to kick us off, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure thing. And thanks very much for having me. And again, uh, sorry for the sorry for the delay. Thanks everyone for being patient. Um, so yes, my name is Rob Prince. I'm the client services director at Talent Nexus. Um, so my job is essentially to join the dots between uh, the challenges that our our clients, potential clients, um, are facing uh, with with whatever that solution may be. So we we basically do kind of two. Uh, two main areas of specialism. We do programmatic advertising on the one side, which is all about um, helping uh, helping clients get better value from when they're advertising jobs. Um, and then we've also got content marketing and employer branding, uh, which is all about kind of improving engagement and conversion rates. Fantastic. Um, and thank you very much indeed for, for, for joining us today. And we, we've um, we've spoken a few times over the past few days and, and um, what we, we've both got this topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, close at heart, we're, we're going to talk about candidate splicing and dicing. Um, and we're literally not going to splice candidates um, and dice them up as much as I'm pretty sure um, that most of us during a recruitment career probably have wanted to do that to candidates and clients. I know I have um, over the past 15 years on on a few a few different occasions. But what we're talking about here is um, candidate splicing and dicing from two different um, angles. The first one is from a database management perspective so how do you get insight into your candidates that will then help you to drive your candidate personas to then help you target um, the right candidates at, at the right time for you as well but then the content side um, of it and, and Rob that's that's probably more where we're go you're going to come in I think we're more talking about the content side we will we will talk about it um, as well. Hopefully, guys, what we're going to show you is both some theoretical stuff. We're going to show you some some statistics for, from 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 both sides um, uh, as well. So hopefully, you'll get some some really nice insight over the next forty five minutes. Um, if you do know anyone who might had to drop off, then um, or if you had to drop off yourself, no problem at all. Um, that this will go out as a recording to everyone who um, who registered anyway. So um, listen, let's kick off nicely. Let's talk about candidate data. Um, Rob, tell me about your experience working with candidate data and what you see as, as the primary challenges that you've had when you're when you're working with a new client or when you've been working with your own data. How do you actually um, get into that data to, to really understand how useful it could actually be? Well, I, I think the first thing to mention would be that actually I, I'm still speaking to a lot of employers, even quite large employers, who don't think that they have a huge amount of candidate data to work with. Um, so my, my first point would be that um, the way I like to approach candidate data is to think first about the candidate journey, uh, to map that out from um, having never considered um, you, know, you as an employer before, have never heard of you as an employer, right through to being a kind of hire or advocate, um, and think about all of the different conversion points that you need uh, along that journey. Um, and actually, a lot of employers will find that if they break if they break that journey down into chunks, they'll they've probably got a lot more data than they may think, uh, and it or, or at least it um, exists even if it's not particularly accessible just now. Um, so we find normally the first thing to do is a bit of a um, bit of an audit or, or review of the source of data that's available, um, and once you start digging down into that, you you. The, the opportunities kind of rise up to the top of that data, right? So if, you, if you've mapped out the candidate journey and you see that actually conversion rates are pretty great, apart from in one glaring area, that really quickly gives you an obvious priority to start with. And I think making data accessible is probably the first, uh, the first step that employers maybe struggle with. How, how do you do that? Where, where do you, so if you're sitting with an employer that thinks that they don't have any data, what, what's your starting point to, to actually A, find that da data and B, make it, um, make it accessible, as you say? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, as I said, I, I would start with going through uh, that candidate journey with them specific for their, their journey, right? So they will have, uh, they will know which social media platforms that they're using, how those are managed. 
Um, and as we go through that journey, they can start plugging uh, bits of data into this, uh, you know, into this sort of document we've got together. Um, which social media channels are using and how are they being managed? Um, when someone comes to the careers website, which analytics package have you got installed on the on the website? Which landing pages have you got data forms on? Um, where where are these bits of data starting to drop in? Once once they've uh, applied for a job or registered for more information, um, where's that information coming from? More often than not, it's email, but but not always. Um, where does the ATS plug into this system? You know, well, what are all those touch points that you have from beginning to end that you can start uh, collectively building up a really clear vision of what's going on? And obviously, I mean, with with candidate D, uh, candidate ID in mind, um, some of these platforms will join the dots in a much more um, sort of clean visual way than others. Um, for people not using a, a kind of all-encompassing platform, they might have to do a lot of manual data wrangling themselves but normally there is a bit more data there than people would expect as long as you've got the the kind of support and insight to actually make sense of it, it, it is my experience so far yep absolutely Could, couldn't agree more with that um my, my pr primary experience over the years has always been <clears throat> about um clients not using their ATS um, or, or not using their, their CRM, um, the, um, you know, the average rates of engagement across existing um, ATSs and CRM is, is generally low, kind of anywhere between 5 and, and 12%. So we always find that, that, that that's where the low hanging fruit is, that, that's the first place that you go to. Naturally, after that, there's lots of other other places and I'm talking mainly about known candidate data so people who who we know about um, and we've actually got identifiable contact information for as opposed to to the, the those who are at that time um, unknown but you know you've obviously got um, your social media and um, sourcing if you're lucky enough to have a sourcing team brilliant um, you've got your alumni um, so you know, former employees. Don't don't forget about those. You've got your milk ground. So all your your graduate and, and early careers um, data as well. Um, referral data. If you if you can make a referral program bro work brilliant, or that that's one of the, the kind of harder harder ones to do as well. So yeah, that there's literally no no um, no lacking of data. C certainly in our experience, um, though the the biggest challenge um, um, after you've found the data is actually about the quality of the data. Now, mm -hmm. I've taken a look at the uh, our, our client data that, that we see, I've looked at it at a top level, and this is across all of our clients over the past two years. And, and here's some stats, which might be surprising to some people, but might not be to, to others, but seeing it, um, Seeing it hard like that is is mental. You know, seventeen percent of email addresses on average across our clients, um, they're missing or they're invalid. Now, um, as part of the candidate ID platform, we do do email validation, and it often surprises people the number of email addresses that are actually invalid. If you think about it, the vast majority, about eighty-seven percent of our candidates, uh, or um, candidates that our clients send campaigns to through through candidate ID use Gmail or Hotmail. There's 13 percent of them will be AOL or Blue Yonder or Yahoo or these old legacy email addresses. So a lot of that information is out to date, out of date. But knowing who those people are, Rob, is is really really important because then you can start to think about like what you're saying, the different channels that you can actually go after your old ca old candidates on as well. So, you know, do you then start to think about, you know, trying to find and identify those people on LinkedIn or, or using using sourcing tools as well? Do you work with any clients on, on that refresh basis where they've got um, data that's out of date or data that's wrong and, um, and then helping them to run campaigns to try and get that data refreshed? It's an interesting one. We used to do an awful lot of that with uh, job boards. Um, job boards, as, as you can imagine, they are much more, typically, job boards are much more switched on to data than employers have been in the past, and employers are kind of catching up with the market because for job boards, all of their value is in data, um, whereas employers, um, it's, it's the connection between data and candidates that is actually the important bit. Um, but increasingly, employers are, are waking up to the fact that if they've got a database of 20,000 candidates um, and they're spending money on advertising to new ones when they could be re-engaging the old ones, that that is a massive inefficiency there. So more and more we're seeing, um, 
within the kind of list of priorities that we're presented with, you know, in terms of what to focus our content marketing on, um, refreshing candidate databases, re-engaging candidates, um, reminding candidates of new opportunities or how the employer brand or EVP might have changed or refreshed uh, is increasingly coming into that kind of top three or five um, sort of priorities from clients is what is what we're seeing. Um, and I think the a lot of the, like these stats on screen at the moment are indicative of um, kind of two other things which we would typically look at, which would be how old is the data? Because I mean, if you're seeing that, you know, your example of email addresses there, um, if you're seeing like AOL uh, and NTL world email addresses, probably because the data is really old. And actually, if, if, that, uh, if that's a sign of the quality of the data, then you could probably bet that their um, work experience, maybe their location, what they're interested in, those things are also changing as well. Um, and similarly, the source of the data you know, if, if you've got, uh, for example, information coming through things like um, industry events or careers fair would be the equivalent on like the milk round. Um, that would probably tell you a very different batch of information about your um, about your data um, as long as it's being tracked and being taken note of. Totally. And, and that, that the, the point that you're you're making about the age of data, um, we we you know, I've worked worked <clears throat> with employers um, in the past where they, they think that old data that there's no value in, in old data just because the email address isn't isn't valid. Do you know that that's certainly certainly not 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 the case. But it's important to acknowledge that <clears throat> email address. Yeah, if there is an email address out of date, there's a good chance some of the other information um, is is out, out of date as well. Um, the but but actually getting to that information and, and trying to update it in a variety of different ways um, is is an important thing to do. And and um, you know even if you use your you've got you know say you've got eighty three percent of your email addresses are valid, you know if you can use lookalike audiences um, in a variety of the different platforms, for example, then there's actually a good chance you might be able to get to those thirteen percent um sorry 17 percent of candidates who you do have any an invalid email address for now the the other the other one that we look at quite substantially though is mobile number as well so just because the email address is invalid it doesn't mean that the mobile number is invalid certainly um for those in the uk we we are finding that e, that, that mobile numbers in the main are valid you know people don't change their mobile number um that much so so whilst their job title and their location information and their social media information and even their name um and e um, as well as email address might change the one thing that we kind of hang our hat on and i'll come on to this in a minute when we look at stats is actually the mobile number might be valid <laughs> do you know that that's a that's one that, that that can work quite tactically um i never recommend to people that they start blasting out text messages to their entire candidate database that's just crap that's just a shit way of going about things but <clears throat> but it's important to look at your data and go what you know where is there a good chance that this is going to be valid you know what 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 piece of data out of those six components is most likely to be valid and in, in our experience okay yeah a lot of them are, are incorrect or missing but sit out of that that remains or that are there you know that that's making up that 69 percent of your databases is a massive way you know massive massive way to, to 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 contact people so yeah get getting your data right <clears throat> understanding that and then um segmentation so um, Rob, Rob, how do you, once you know that the data, you've got your data sources established, you know that the data is correct, you've got confidence um, in the data, how, how do you then start to, to, to work with clients to segment that data? Well, I think the one of the, the important places to start with segmentation is that I, I believe that there is no right or wrong way to segment um, candidate audiences. Um, for me, that should entirely be driven by the objective of the marketing that you're trying to do. Um, as, as an example, you could arbitrarily split up a database by all, all manner of kind of regular fields, you know, whether that was a seniority, location, um, how, how old the record is, that sort of stuff. Um, but there are, um, if you try and tie that to an objective instead, the uh, the effectiveness will be that much higher. So an example I would use would be uh, like diversity. So a lot of employers that we're working with at the moment are really keen to improve their diversity and inclusion across their hiring. Um, now, if they were to do that with existing candidates that they're trying to re-engage, then the ways that they would um, be hoping to segment their data by demographics, by DNI uh, sort of stats and figures, um, would be completely different to if their objective was well. Actually, we want to we want to increase the amount of senior applications we get, for example. 
Um, so rather than a sort of arbitrary set of rules for segmenting data, I'd say that actually I would always encourage starting with the, the ultimate goal, the objective, and then working back from there. And if you do that, more often than not, you'll get the right um, you'll get the right answer in the in the data. I found. So, so what that means then is that actually for every campaign, um, your segmentation uh, is going to be different um, potentially from from campaign um, from from campaign. How 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 do you find or how how do you set up clients in order to cope with that? Because um, you know the, the 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 variety of different platforms that they're using, unless they're using a pure pure marketing platform, a pure marketing marketing analytics platform, um, you know they're using GA or if they're fortunate enough to go into GA three hundred and sixty or something, then mm -hmm. um, actually that segmentation from campaign campaign can be be very very challenging and can be very very difficult so uh, if if you are working with someone who <clears throat> does need to to segment differently from campaign to campaign how do you support them so that that doesn't become overbearing i think um the, the first thing i would say is that the um the difficulties of segmenting data in the first place are far fewer than the difficulties of trying to do it after the fact um, so you're like the more specific you can be with marketing, the more effective it will be as a general rule. Um, but that said, you know, there, there, it, there is still some kind of heavy lifting involved there and the way we would normally um, approach that. I think re recording results and uh, being consistent in the way that you're dealing with data is really important. Um, if n normally what happens when people um, start doing marketing in a sort of serious way, they um, They'll do a couple of like trial campaigns um, and just, you know, they'll, they'll be keen to get stuck into the data and actually producing stuff. Um, and what they will sometimes find after the fact is that they haven't kept, actually kept a careful enough record of exactly how they were doing that segmentation, the logic behind who they were and weren't including. And it then makes it very difficult to build and grow upon what you've done. Um, if, if you stick to a very strict methodology and stick to a uh, like a framework that you can continue to use going forwards, as and when things do and don't work, you can react accordingly. Um, and it will, you know, in the first few campaigns, the, the things that go wrong will be just as important as the things that go right. Um, and even even where you're doing that manually rather than on an automated platform, if you you know have got the, the luxury of being able to do that, um, as long as you're keeping careful record of that and, and being um, uh, sort of systematic in the way that you're doing it. it it's actually much easier to manage than, than people often think, I think. That's, re that's really good advice. And um, we we tend to go into clients um, where where those mistakes have already been made, as I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure that you do. So um, it, it's one of the hardest things to do and one of the hardest things to stick to, particularly when teams change, the person with responsibility for it um, ch changes over time um, and where your technology platform maybe doesn't quite quite support it. We, we're in a fortunate position with Candidate ID where we can, can um, set up the segmentation again for the client so actually we can base it on the data that's coming out of their source mm -hmm. and we can base it on anything that's on the on the on the candidate's profile so we can almost start again so we're we're not restricted so i, th I think if anyone's having my, my my kind of key takeaway from it is if everyone's anyone's having any problems with their segmentation don't be afraid of starting again with it actually don't be afraid of taking the data put trying it in a different platform um you know and and then start starting again and, and just really thinking about it but then actually thinking if you're setting up those rules and setting up the new rules thinking about how it ties into the like you say the campaign objectives and and then the content naturally which takes me nicely uh, a nice wee segue into and in, into our next bit talk, talking about content so you know once you understand your data and once you know your understand your segmentation you know the objectives of of the campaign how, how do you then go about rob deciding what the right type of content is and the right type of channel to to, to use as as part of that um there's a there's a long answer and a short answer. So I'll start with the short answer and then we'll see see if we get to the long one. Um, I think for for us, um, as with anything else, it starts with um, it starts with the candidate. It starts with um, building out a clear picture of who they are, what their wants, needs, aspirations, and challenges are, um, and then not even starting to think about 
the format of the content, the creative from the content, um, until you've got the really, really clear brief of what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, if you look at all of the, the best examples of bad marketing, um, it's because the idea came before an understanding of the candidate or the consumer did. Um, so, uh, you, you know, for example, uh, for years, the, the kind of bane of content marketing has been um, flooding social media with content that doesn't really do anything. Um, it's, it's content for the sake of content. It's those kind of vanity metrics stuff. Um, and that's because the, the brief hasn't included any kind of metric for success or any real understanding of what the candidate might be wanting or looking for. Um, so that's where I would always start. The, 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 the shorter version of this, the, where I would always start is what's the candidate looking for at their specific stage of the candidate journey in which we're talking about in, in that specific context. Um, and once we know that, what's the most effective way of us communicating that to them? The way that I tend to approach it um, is thinking I'd, I always set up a campaign hypothesis. So, um, so I, I'll, I'll look at as well as absolutely having the objective under, or, you know, what do we want to achieve out of it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think about, okay, you know, what do we want to achieve out of it? But realistically, what do we think is going to happen based on mm -hmm. um, past experience or based on you know um, any any evidence that that we actually that, that we actually do have? So. It almost, uh, you know, the, the hypothesis um, is different from what the objectives, because because we all know, <clears throat> as as budget holders and, and organisations, that actually the the reality of an objective can be completely different from what we think is actually going to happen. So, um, the the objective could be okay. I want to, you know, from a database of a thousand people, I want to hire five people now you know by then looking at okay the quality of the data looking at the content that we've actually got available um looking at the team that we've got realistically available what what you know and is realistically actually going, going to happen and sometimes kind of grounding it back into reality then helps to reshape the objective um you know in in, in the first place by by yeah. looking at all of the different factors you know the resource and what, what's going to be available the quality of the data that's actually there you know it can help us just reframe um and and, and refocus refocus that objective absolutely and and for me reality is one of the key sort of words that you've seen there um, and, and one of the realities of marketing to candidates um, is that with a single piece of content, you will only ever move a candidate one step along in their journey. Um, one, of the, one of the sort of cardinal sins, I think, that the industry sees a lot, um, and I'll, I'll go back to social media because it's such an easy example, is posting a, um, a job with the call to action of apply now. Um, onto a social platform that is aimed at candidates who haven't really considered working for you before. Now, the, the problem with that, obviously, is that you're trying to take a, an essential stranger to the recruitment brand and move them all the way through the recruitment process in one leap. Um, that, that is going to be far less effective than re-engaging a candidate that's already hit five or six different touch points and is already on your email database. And actually, all you're trying to do is see if you're interested in one specific job that's very relevant to them. Um, and I think that that's one of the key realities in kind of um, when I'm thinking about which channels and types of content are most effective um, is like what's what's the actual uh, what, what's the, the the initial objective which step are you trying to get them to make always with recruitment the ultimate objective is to hire the person right <laughs> or, or decide whether you don't want to hire them um, but the but you know which which kind of micro conversions are contained within that main objective I think is a really really useful place to start as well. Uh, absolutely, and it's a, it's you know making sure that you've got the tools and you've got the platform to measure that. So it's about going okay if you're <clears throat> running running a, an email and SMS campaign through something like Candidate ID, you know do you have the tool to be able to see see how. You know, engaged people are, and you know, we do it through the ID score. So we we do it through scoring. So we um, <clears throat> score candidates based on their engagement with emails, text messages, landing pages, um, and 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 the client's website. There is absolutely no point, you know, out of if I start a campaign against five thousand people, there's no point in me <clears throat> trying to sell sell the job um, to to those candidates. A absolutely not, you know. However, there is a point. I, I think one of the things that I would always do though is is certainly talk about 
the the eventual objective, you know, like you say, mm -hmm. you, you made a really, really good point there. Um, <clears throat> if I just share um, my screen a second, just to show this, but, you know, you've made a point there that obviously the eventual objective um, of any of this work is to hire. What, what I've found in, in our experience with clients is where we avoid talking about hiring at all in early communication it leads to confusion um from from the candidate side you know the the candidates um are not you know really sure about the reason for engagement mm -hmm. um you you have to tell candidates and you have to be fairly you know black and white about it and go look we're contacting you because we are recruiting at the moment you know i'm not going to talk to you about jobs right now what i am going to talk right. to you about is, is, is some other things so you know we do it with spec savers you know for example um some of the top performing content um that we have with spec savers and with some other clients is where we do talk about the fact that they're joining this community to talk about jobs and we will talk about jobs at some point but actually the other stuff that we're going to send you is all about you know um optimal Optometry, ophthalmology, audiology, all the stuff that these these guys are, are really interested in. It's really, really clear content. Um, quizzes and salary surveys are the two that work really well across our um, across our content um, or ac across our clients' campaigns. That the uh, this quiz um, that the Specsavers ran in May was massively successful. We've got um, a, a scientific company just now who are running uh, salary surveys across our database, and the stats. I mean, they're, they're getting people about you know ten thousand people telling them what salary they're on at the moment. You know, out out of the database, it's, it's 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 absolutely astounding. So, as well as having content that can be repurposed and pushed back, um, you know, they're actually getting really really good market market insight stuff that they can they can use um internally as well. So, so I think yeah, you know, don't you know don't don't sell don't sell jobs. Absolutely not. You know, make sure like you're saying like you're absolutely saying you know. To talk about other things but but make the objective clear you know what what are you you're trying to do there um eventually what is the eventual outcome going to be i mean my pet hey i'm going to show some content examples that do work here uh, just go back a little bit but this is my pet hey you know this is you know every everyone that, that, that works for a company loves their own brand and they actually sometimes forget that nobody outside of their company generally will give a shit about their own brand you know unless they are a, a big consumer brand okay then they probably don't really care who, who you are the vast majority of hiring and the vast majority of what we do with our clients um is, is business to business brands do you know that's it and and unless they work in that sector and unless they're completely aware really they've got really in-depth knowledge of that sector they probably don't actually know know who the client clients are and we're working with some clients just now some big big businesses you know who uh you know just make an assumption that because they're a household name in the in their sector that the candidates that they're trying to target will automatically know who they are they they, they simply they simply don't so I, I think the positioning in the early stages of the business you know understanding <clears throat> um or trying to get over to the candidates you know a bit of a story about who who the business are um and our experience in our experience are very very interested in the product or the service they want to know actually if they've never heard of the brand okay cool that's fine tell me about the brand but tell me what you're actually trying to do is it an interesting or unique problem that, that you're trying to solve do you know we've worked with um a company called sightminder in sydney um in australia who do middleware for the hotel industry and as soon as you talk about that it starts to make sense as soon as you say by the way see when you you um you when you book a hotel if it's a family say it's a mama and papa hotel based in ohio um if you um book a hotel on their website um there's a good chance that they're using SiteMinders technology in the background to actually power how they link between expedia and them for example so you know as soon as you start to talk about that story again we're avoiding anything related to jobs really but if you start to talk about the product and the service and the problem that they're trying to solve that works really really well and that that also um, Im improves engagement mm. one thing i'd add to that i think it's a manifestation of what you've alluded to which is the uh sometimes a lack of self-awareness from an employer of what they're actually uh, what they actually need to be communicating in the first or, or well whichever instance that you know whichever stage they're at and that is the um, I see a lot which is like the constant repetition of things which are true of all employers um, as if that's the most important bit of information to convey um, the uh, like uh, I think 
you know, oftentimes if I sit down in a workshop with employers and say, right, tell me about what it's like to work at, you know, your organization, um, I could, without knowing anything about the organization whatsoever, I could probably guess the first five or 10 things that they'll tell me because every employer says it about themselves. Right? <laughs> um, and that's, you know, with, without meaning to be sort of dismissive of those things, because they're important, they're also not unique. So in exactly the same way that, you know, when you're selling cars, you don't start with, well, you know, we've got four really great wheels. The engine is really good. You, you, you start with you start with the bits that make that that car special and, and what's uh, what makes driving that car feel different to driving any other car. Right. There's no point going through the basics every single time you do your car. Out, right. And it's exactly the same with employers, I think. And I think actually if if every employer decided that actually the only things they would talk about were the things that are genuinely unique about their organization, they would find it much easier to cut through all of the noise that exists in the platforms that they're trying to post to. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree more. It's almost naturally we experiment throughout this process. You know, we figure out what content um, is going to work and what content isn't going to work. You, you do split testing um, before committing to campaigns, you know, sending out your content to small small mm -hmm. pieces, small segments of your database to see what, what's going to work and, and what doesn't work. I always think, though, there's a pre-testing, you know, a pre-split testing method as well. Something I quite often do is I'll take a piece of content um, and I'll run it past someone who's not involved at all so i'll speak to my girlfriend for example say what do you think of this you know piece of content um you know i've even said stuff to my mum in the past um we we are we're recruiting for a developer just now and um i've ran some some content past a, de a developer friend you know someone who doesn't really know what we do um you know but I've, I've i've written written the spec i've started to do some copy for advertising do that um i've run it past them do you know so use there's that you know sense check it with people who aren't actually anything you know any, anywhere close to your world and, and what you're actually yeah. actually doing to see if it makes sense because it, it comes back to one of my pet peeves is when we call um, and I know there's a lot of disagreement on this is when we, we always call people we're trying to target um, you know target for, for jobs as candidates you know people aren't candidates until they apply uh, you know that that's not what they are so before that they're, they're simply people so test your content on people people first um, there's five examples on this slide of content for us that's that's worked particularly well with clients and um, one thing I'll always say please remember guys always think mobile first um, 87% of our content is opened up on mobile phones first okay so everything has to be done um, you know with with one eye on the fact that they're going to be open that candidates are going to be opening it from an iOS or from an Android device that's just fine they may continue their journey later on a different device that's that's what we normally find however everything is going to be driven by email first and with the um, um, things like AMP for Gmail coming coming through um, which is going to really change the way that we actually use um, email um, then this is just going to continue that this trend we're never ever going to move away um, from mobile um, Starbucks um, have used leadership content that works really really well spec savers who have spoken about technical ton content about um, optometry and ophthalmology and audiology um, we've got an agency client um, in, in Florida um, the Mullings group who specialize in, in biotech they use um, so some really good and deep insight within within the, the their their industry. They're getting out. They're meeting uh, leaders within the industry. They're interviewing them about about what's actually going on. They're going to keep conferences. At no point are they selling a job, and that they're giving some career advice. You know, you can see that first article there is um, no straight career path, but you know they're not actually saying here here's a job. Uh, Dialogue Semiconductor. They are telling the story um, about what they're trying to do um, with it within the industry and um, real life time is another agency client they've uh, that's another salary survey um there at the end so so that that's five pieces of content that that have had probably i think those five have all been certainly in the top 10 most uh, best performing bits of content um that, that that we've had um in campaigns rob is there anything any other specific examples of content anything that you've worked with that, that have performed particularly well on top of what we've discussed it, it, it's interesting to see your examples actually, because in a and, and your previous um, spec savers example, we we've um, not too long ago had real success with a um, a quiz um, for social care workers, um, and the part of that brief was as well as just wanting the engagement 
Um, they, you know, they, they want more, more people to know about them as brand and they want more people engaging. What they would actually like is to filter out um, a, there is a, it, it's sort of well, well understood that there is a bracket of people who work in social care um, who are really sought after because they're the ones who work in social care because they really, really care that they will go above and beyond for whoever they work for to make sure there's a great outcome. Um, and there are others who are seeing it as an alternative to any other kind of relatively low paid, unskilled work, right? And they were like, we particularly want the, these guys who really, really care. So as part of that quiz, we, it was actually about developing your career by understanding your personality traits. Um, and that performed really, really well because there was a depth of content there which reflected really well on the employers and also it gave the candidates real value in a way that other, other bits of content weren't. Um, we've done similar things um, you know, for head teachers. We talked about Ofsted. Um, it, it's, it's that kind of applying direct value in a way that is relevant to careers, but in exactly the same way that you say, you know, it doesn't have to be, do you want this job? Well, do you want this job in a week or do you want this job in a year? Like it doesn't all have to be job related content. Career related content is often fine as long as it's done with a, um, a mind to how that would fit into a campaign more broadly. Some, some of my favourite content, and I spoke about this on one of my previous webinars with Mark Horning, um, mm -hmm. some of the brilliant stuff that I, I love is community, um, but where it is a real you know, community is so misrepresented as a phrase when it comes to talent acquisition. But where there's brands like Monzo or AHA, um, mm -hmm. they, they're two examples of, of people who have set up um, communities um, for their customers. Um, yeah. So Monzo in particular does it really well. If you're a Monzo, cust Monzo Bank customer, you're probably on the community. You've probably read all, all the forum posts. So that's where they hire from. They, they hire from the community. So straight away, they're going, well, we've got a bunch. We've got loyal customers. We've got people who know the product inside out. We've got people who are giving advice to other customers who are effectively acting as volunteer um, um, employees um, for us. And why wouldn't you dip into, into that pool, pool of talent? And when you watch the community, community turn when you watch people become community members becoming employees it's fascinating you look through their profile and you see oh of course that that ma makes perfect sense that that person um would become would become an employee um so i've got a question from marvin data suggests that we must be lifetime learners have we used um profession-based content um to to build engagement absolutely so green club um for spec savers is, is the perfect example of that marvin you know that's continuous uh, professional development content um that there's um the candidates can score cpd points um for every time that they learn a blog and, and the blogs are certified um so by the professional institute so they keep the the website keeps a track of everything um that they're learning everything that they're reading um and the number of points that they score um for each blog um and then they can use use that for that um rob have you got any other examples of, of lear using learning content um to build engagement the, the one that springs to mind is uh, we, for, for some reason, I seem to have worked with a lot of engineering companies in, in, in my career. I, it's just, you know, one of those things. Once you work with one, you tend to work with a few more. Um, and specifically within engineering, because there's there are so many different areas of specialism and there's so much progression um, right from the beginning of, of your career where you need to be you know, uh, professionally accredited and you need to become properly qualified. And then your career can go in, you know, one of hundreds of different routes. Um, one of the things that I've, I've often found myself talking to employers about is how they can harness um, nurturing candidates as they go through that journey um, and recognising that even if they don't, even if they're not quite right um, for a specific role just yet, they will stay engaged with that kind of professional development content um, in, until they are ready to kind of fill a specific role. And I, I think actually the, the whole concept of learning um, is, is a really valuable thing to consider in this kind of marketing mix um, because it's, that, that is a prime example of providing candidates with something that speaks directly to their wants and needs at a given point in their journey. Um, so if, they're, you know, if, if their biggest pain point as a candidate is they're not entirely sure where their career should go now because they've got a few different options, Providing some further information there puts you in a really fantastic place in employees to be engaging with them in a very real sense. 
Absolutely, and um, the uh, for for me that learning content as well as well as nurturing them through through the journey, it can be for that like Green Club um, spec savers. It can be, you know, leading them towards another qualification or, or their CPD or whatever it is. But it can also be informal learning as well. We we um, worked with on Fido um, last year. We did a, a little bit of work with with those guys um, on Fido. Um, again, they another middleware company actually. Um, they they do. Um, um, integrations with banking apps so they do things like um identity verification so if you're signing up for a new bank then rather than having to do the old-fashioned thing of walking into a branch with your passport then they do it all on your on your mobile device um and these they they are the provider of that technology for some of the big banks um but their their lear learning bro, uh, blog on medium is, is phenomenal it's, it's, it's absolutely tremendous so it explains it's very transparent it's very open and it talks about about how they're actually actually solving solving problems on a day-to-day -day basis so so they're helping to to educate the community and of course there's um you know um other other examples of that whether it's um on medium whether it's a face-to-face -face events um that that learning content is the best best type of content now um that that said it can be at times the most challenging bits of content to to create you you need to have have someone um, really within your team, or or an external writer um, who who really knows their, their onions. You know, someone who really knows um, what what they're actually talking about before they do it. I'm working with a client just now, a, a global um, a FTSE 500 business, um, who are doing some amazing things um, within machine learning. Some 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 of the most brilliant applications of it um, that, that that I've seen. But what we, what they're struggling with is is getting Getting someone to actually talk about it and, and and actually talk about it in a way that that makes sense within the community and who can write with that level of authority. So so that's my caveat on on learning content. You know, for me, you, you need to find people who are willing to contribute to the content content who have got confidence and who have got authority um, and who can write write it without someone calling bullshit that that's that's my my caveat on it but it is for me um marvin's um absolutely spot on there um that you know lifetime learning is absolutely you know uh, uh, is massive within within pretty much every industry that i'm aware of and you can take advantage advantage of that by by providing some really really good authoritative um content if you've got the resource internally internally to do it yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely um, e echo that caveat, actually. I think if you plotted all different types of content on a graph with, you know, price up the y-axis and the sort of value down the x, um, learning content is is both really, really valuable and also probably quite resource intensive to produce for all of the reasons you've just alluded to. Yeah. Whether we've done it in engineering, cybersecurity, the top end of education, like these are not things that you can get a enthusiastic content exec to sit down and just kind of see how they get on like this this is super high level degree educated and above level sort of you know uh, understandings of topics so um the, find find the low uh, low friction ways of getting that information across to candidates as a starting point would be my recommendation yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's not something that you're going to give to um, an intern. <laughs> um, when, or at when least you might in. regret it if you do. <laughs> yeah, unless unless you know there, there's something to be said. You know, if you can get a good, you know, graduate from that field. You know, someone. You know, if you're an engineering firm and and you get someone yeah. who's a good, you know, could they write with confidence? It's absolutely. Are they going to be able to do webinars? Are they going to be able to do to do that kind of thing? Um, possibly not. Uh, actually, one of our partners, um, one of our one of our um the companies we work with um who work in india actually um what they do with it is, is they actually provide free um free programming education so you know they, they mm -hmm. provide through their own they've got their own proprietary software um that they use internally for for training training their staff on on different development languages and um design principles and, and that type of thing they make um, a lot of that content available free um externally and um, they then measure the success of people and people who they think that they're performing or performing well the invite for interview now you're going to have, a, have to have a really good data privacy policy um in, in order in order to justify that um certainly in europe um but it works it works brilliantly and what it does do in their market their their challenge isn't that they've got 
Um, they've, they, they, they've not got enough candidates. They've got too many candidates. They're just not at the quality that they they, they need. Um, so they use that as a way, effectively, of you know um, setting up their assessment centres. You know, they go right. These are the people who have performed really well in these assessments um, this week, um, they, and then invite them in. Now, it is, it's difficult. Do you know, it's 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 a time-consuming process to do. But you know, it's also difficult having a hundred people turn up to an assessment centre and only being able to get one hire hire from it. So you know, it's you. Look at it one way. You look at it uh, at it the other. Both are labour intensive. What's the best? What, where are you actually going to get the um, the, the best result from? Well, um, I know I know where I would gamble. I know I know what way um, I would go. So um, I'm just double checking our agenda because we're starting to kind of come up to the end of the 45 minutes, guys. If there's any other questions, please please bring them in. As per usual, um, I normally talk too much um, and we normally go off at a tangent, um, but I think we've done okay before. Um, just now, so we've spoken about um, database. We're talking about you know splicing and dicing that the pain of content marketing, how you actually get the right kind of content through, what type of content works, what kind of content doesn't work. We've shown data, some lessons, quite a fit quite a lot into the past then um, for forty two minutes. Um, any particular? I've spoken about a specific um, couple of employers that we've worked with, a couple of case studies. Um, Rob, is there any specific case studies that you want to talk about um, to, to the group? Anything that you think's particularly worked? Just to, to wrap us up. I, I think for me, if you look um, if you look across the board at the things that um, reliably work really really well, um, I would say it's it's the examples where um, where it's highly targeted and highly kind of specific um, as possible. Um, I think pinpointing a specific leakage in, in the in the candidate journey um, is a really good way of improving results in a really tangible way uh, with, with you know just with with some really pinpoint content. So an example would be um, I was I was in a workshop just the other day and we were talking about how the um, the the, de the delay in between applying for a job and receiving interview information was too long and they were losing candidates because they were high competition candidates. Right. That that is such an uh, an obvious and easy, relatively easy fix. Um, automating that bit of the journey so that as soon as somebody applies or, or gets shortlisted, they receive high quality, high relevance, you know, information ahead of their interview. Yeah. How much is that going to affect the candidate experience, right? And, and, and how how fantastic the results can be relative to not doing it. So I think like that that is a really nice example. I like. Um, um, a personal touch recently that I, um, that I was talking to a client about was their um, hiring developers. They're really keen to um, try and balance out the, the gender diversity if they can, because even though um, they get a relatively good number of female applicants, they find that they, they disproportionately drop out of the process as they go through. Um, so one of the ways we tried to fix that was we, um, we prepared, um, you know, we started preparing content specifically about being a female developer within the organisation and the industry generally, so I can go out before interviews, and that's something that's a you know a, a um, personalised candidate journey. Um, and then, in a in a very personal way, within the recruitment team, they've started um, having pre-interview phone calls with one of the existing female developers in the team, talking to those candidates directly, right? Just if they've got any questions, make them feel at ease. And the reason I like that specifically is because it combines a very traditional marketing approach of like producing a thing right a, a a document that we can send out and we can automate with a very personal approach that the recruitment team really got behind so we're like yeah that's, that's actually exactly what we should be doing let's you know so combine those two and you, you create this really nice um really nice blend of the two and, and really great results as uh, as a consequence so um i suppose those, those would be my, my two kind of favorite things recently being really really specific um, and looking for the most direct ways to fix um, those, those kind of challenges on the on the candidate journey. Brilliant, brilliant. That's fantastic examples. Um, couldn't agree more on the automation. For me, it's something I was doing 15 years ago. Um, if you're not doing it um, now, there the, there is literally no excuse. It costs it now costs you nothing. It used to cost you cost you a bit of money 15 years ago to do it. But you know, there's there's just fantastic 
tools that, that, that can plug in. You, even if you don't want to link it to your ATS, guys, there, there's plenty of other, other tools that allow you to automate these journeys that, that can either be, you know, an enterprise level um, or um, like Candidate ID, we can do do a lot of that. Um, or, you know, if you want to do it cheap and cheerfully, there's tools like Zapier and, and if this and then that and, and these kind of things that, that allow you to, to set up sequences and, and, and do that. Um, one, one final question, um, Marvin um, has asked, do you have a method of understanding the stage of a prospect's journey as a signal, you know, when they might be open to a conversation about a job? In other words, do you map your content to the stage of what a prospect wants, consumes at each stage of the journey? Um, Rob, do you want to, to, to take that? Um, and, and I'll add my two cents um, once, once you're finished. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I, I think it links back to um, one of the points I made right at the beginning. I think we're thinking about content as serving a purpose at a specific stage of the candidate journey. And I think what Marvin's alluding to is just adding an extra layer of detail to that, which is um, knowing what we do about our candidates. At what stage of this this content campaign are they most likely to be open to a, a direct conversation about jobs and receiving um, you know, job alerts or, or a phone call or, or whatever that is at your organization. Um, so I think my my method would be an extension of what I would do with any content campaign. So I would I would map out the candidate journey and all the touch points along the way. Um, I would map on that journey exactly where I wanted bits of content to sit, whether that was a landing page, whether it was an automated email, whether it was a you know PDF document, whatever that a video, whatever that is. Um, and then on the line underneath, I would um, I would assign either a score um, or a uh, or in qualitative terms, um, what do I think the candidate wants at that point, and at what point do we think it's appropriate for us to, to start engaging with them uh, about specific jobs, and and exactly how you engage with them may also change depending on what type of candidate it is. Some candidates may, may be really keen to receive job alerts through to their inbox but would find the idea of being called by someone on the recruitment team absolutely awful. Right? And other candidates would want the exact opposite. Right, The last thing they want is more stuff to read, but they would be really open to a quick chat with one of the friendly guys in the recruitment team. So again, I would, I would recommend making it very specific and not trying to apply too many like broad brush methodologies to it. I think the method is be really specific about the candidate journey and what you're trying to achieve. Exactly how that translates to your business or your recruitment process I think that that does depend a lot on which segment you're talking to, how much engagement they've had before, what sort of content they want to, you know, what they want to consume and what they're trying to get out of it as well. Um, would you agree? Couldn't agree more. The um, we, we take a very similar approach. We, we work with um, to, to understand the persona and what the typical journeys of, of the, the personas um, for, for each vacancy might actually be. You know, if um, if they were going to be interested, what route would they take? If they weren't going to be interested, what route, what route would they take? If they prefer video content, what route are they going to take? If they prefer blogs, what route are they going to take? Um, so we map that all out, and we we make sure we we score each um, action that that a candidate takes. So you know, it could be that an email open is one point, um, reading a blog is three points, um, visiting um, career focused content. Uh,
<laughs> guys, we haven't had much luck today at all um, <laughs> with technology. I am so, so sorry. Um, so um, ju just to, to finish that, that statement off, um, you know, if you're not measuring um, you know, what's going on outside of your campaign, um, then you're you, and you can't see everything. It's not a good measure of the success um, of your campaign, and you won't know at the right time when to, to actually tar uh, when to target candidates. Um, and then by applying that scoring methodology that I mentioned, um, you can very easily get to the highest scoring candidates, um, the ones who are you know carrying out the right actions, and then focus um, that that bottom of funnel activity and that conversion activity on those as opposed to targeting someone who's never even opened an email or who's never visited your website um, before before in his life and your life so great listen um rob i want to thank you very much and um, thanks for everyone who's attended and thanks for bearing with us throughout the couple of technical issues that we've had um there must be something up in the matrix today it's, it's just been one of those days so there will be a recording that will be issued um out so we'll, we'll try and edit out um the the technical issues and make it a bit more seamless for you um you can find both um rob and i on linkedin and twitter and probably every other social media platform um that exists and also email so please do get in touch if there's anything specifically that you want to discuss but otherwise thank you so much everyone for your time thanks again rob um and enjoy the rest much. of your uh, tuesday all right thanks, thanks very much sir. guys cheers <laughs>